Canada. Um, before that, he was a fellow in the Department of Statistics and the Computer Science at the University of Texas, Dallas. He received his PhD from um, Innsbruck, Italy, and the master degree from um, Buffalo, um, State University of New York, Buffalo, USA. His research interest lies in data science on complex network and the large scale graph analysis uh, with application in, so in um, social, um, bi biological, uh, IoT, and blockchain networks. He is a Fulbright uh, scholarship recipient and his research work have been published in a leading conference like uh, uh, VODB, ICDM, ICD, and the top uh, journals um, in TKDE. Uh, the second presenter, uh, Yulia Gio, is a professor in the Department of Mathematical Science at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, her research interests include the statistical foundation of data science, uh, inference for random graphs and uh, complex networks, time series analysis, and the predictive analysis. She holds her PhD in mathematics followed by a postdoc um, appointment in statistics at the University of Washington. Um, prior to UT Dallas, she was a tenured faculty member at the University of Waterloo, Canada. She also held a visiting position at the John Hopkins University, University of uh, California, Berkeley, and uh, Isaac Newton uh, Institute for Mathematical Science, Cambridge University, UK. She served as a uh, vice president of the International so Society on Business and Industrial uh, Statistics and is a fellow of American uh, Statistical Association. Uh, the third presenter, Murat uh, Kantasiaglu, uh, really needs no introduction since he is the program committee chair for, for ICD this year, but for the sake of uh, formality, let me um, introduce him uh, briefly. Uh, Murat is a professor in computer science department and director of uh, data security and privacy lab at the University of Texas at uh, Dallas. He is a visiting scholar at the um, data privacy lab at Harvard University. Uh, his research focuses on uh, creating technology that can efficiently extract useful information from any data without sacrificing privacy or security. Um, he has published many papers, more than 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences. Um, he got uh, fundings from a lot of agencies, including NSF, uh, Air Force Research, uh, Sa Air Force uh, Office of Re Science and Research. Um, ONR, NSA, NIH. Um, he is a recipient of NSF Career Proposal Award, and uh, his um, research has been widely reported in the news media. He got his PhD from uh, Purdue University, and uh, he is a senior member of IEEE and uh, ACM. Um, so, uh, since this is an uh, online presentation, uh, we are using this, uh, uh, this Zoom tool. Uh, so if you have the questions during the presentation, uh, you can post it uh, in the chat section in, within the Zoom. Uh, alternatively, we also, have, um, uh, we also have another tool, uh, Slack, that you can use to post your questions over there. So by the end of the presentation, I will collect the questions from these two channels and uh, uh, ask the questions to the presenters on behalf of you. Okay. Um, One quick thing, user. I think since this is a tutorial, if there are questions maybe during the tutorial, maybe we can answer them for clarification. So okay. we don't need to wait because it's three hours and one and a half and another one and a half. Maybe we can yeah. interrupt during the, as well so that something is not unclear for the entire of the talk. So they can interrupt uh, yeah, or, or they post it in the chat section. I will interrupt. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I, I will do that. Yes, so um, great. Uh, without further ado, uh, so let's welcome the three presenters and um, I will leave the podium to, to um, each of you. 
Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, tutorial is by Junaid uh, Akchora, Yulia Gal, and uh, myself. Yulia couldn't be here today uh, due to uh, some personal issue. Uh, so it will be presented mainly by me and Junaid. Uh, so I will start with the first parts uh, uh, in the first part of the tutorial, this next one and a half hour. And Junaid will be uh, continuing with the uh, uh, second part. Uh, as I mentioned, Yulia couldn't be with us today. Uh, you can see my screen, right, on the sides? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank That's you. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so this is a joint effort with uh, many people, uh, especially students, postdocs. We list all of them, but we couldn't fit their, all of their pictures into this uh, slide. So we had many collaborators and uh, and uh, people who are helping with us. So these are some of the people who are there. So we'd like to thank all of them for their help with us. Uh, with the slides and the presentation and the work. Uh, so the first part of this talk is about, uh, uh, or present uh, tutorial will be about uh, the basics. I know most of you have uh, some knowledge about the details, but we would like to clarify also some issues people are commonly mistaken as well about how the blockchains work. Uh, especially from the data point of view. Again, the, our main goal in the story is to focus on the data analysis aspects uh, of uh, data science aspects of blockchain data or the data that's stored on blockchains. So our introduction will be tailored toward uh, these fundamentals of uh, how they are related to for later on the on analysis, analysis of this blockchain data. So the first part will be the basics and especially other uh, data constructs stored on blockchain. The second part will be how we will model with these data. How are we going to analyze this data? And we are going to argue that you need to modify the, even the existing techniques so that they can work on blockchain data due to you know, some uh, novel uh, ways that data is represented and that will be discussed. And at the end, uh, we will do a discussion about cybersecurity aspects and applications of these kind of things. That's, as a data security privacy person, that's an area that I'm, I feel deeply connected and uh, Junaid uh, would talk about those as well. So let me start with the basics. For those who are, uh, who knows this, I think it may be uh, good to re revisit and rem remember that. So if you start with uh, a blockchain, it starts, uh, I start hearing myself. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Satoshi uh, Nakamoto post uh, Bitcoin white paper in 2008, then the first Genesis block happened in 2009. If you look at the landscape, it's uh, first, especially the application of usage of blockchain in, in cryptocurrencies uh, exploded. Uh, after that, uh, of course, the value of these currencies change over time and fluctuates significantly. But Bitcoin uh, started 2009, then we would have uh, Litecoin and it, it has further coins. Uh, there were other coins like Monero out there that has some privacy preserving properties, which we will discuss in the second part. And then there are stable coins like uh, Ripple and of course Ethereum, which becomes a big with respect to smart contracts and other aspects. And there are 800 altcoins that are, uh, are there and each of them are fluctuates with different uh, things going on. So clearly uh, there's a huge uh, popularity with respect to cryptocurrency use of blockchain. Uh, of course, if you look at the blockchain network where all these cryptocurrencies and other information is uh, captured, uh, at least the way uh, it is uh, done uh, is that uh, uh, is uh, uh, the way it is uh, at least happening most of these blockchains is that every node has the full copy of the data. So that's how the uh, 
at least uh, going back in time and checking transactions are achieved. So everybody has access to all of it. So it has some privacy and security issues. And later on, I will discuss about private blockchains or permission blockchains on why uh, this could be a uh, this could be a, a issue and why they are important uh, so here uh, that this in the public version need not appear and existing not disappear all the time uh, when I teach this in my class I always say you know you can just start your laptop try to be a node of course it will be too costly to download all the data and stuff but still you can do it and every neuron node runs the same software. So that's, in a sense, there are common rules that every node runs to verify data blocks. And each node connects to a few others in a peer-to-peer -peer session. And there is no trusted node. So that's the big uh, thing. When I do this in class, I'm trying to argue that the main difference blockchain brings is that uh, we, we, need, we record transactions since the uh, before BC, thousand years before BC, in the kill tablets in Mesopotamia. Now, of course, you have to record the transactions again, but the main difference is that we don't have trusted node. Of course, uh, ARM had a great, ARM and others, DV had a great tutorial on uh, the consensus and other issues. So here, the goal is a single truth about data that can be verified by everyone. In the chat window, there were some chats. Okay. Okay. So I'm continuing. Uh, so, of course, the biggest uh, initial motivator uh, for the blockchain application was uh, Bitcoin. Basically, using this blockchain as a distributed ledger, in other words, where we regularly keep these records, uh, uh, we would record all these financial transactions. So blockchain basically here implies a chain of data blocks and I will talk briefly about what, what, what those are. And then uh, of course the issue becomes uh, which if there are multiple different versions of the truth, in other words, multiple different transactions, a given peer, how the peer would believe a certain version of the truth. In other words, certain version of the uh, transaction. So one may say, one transaction may say th this uh, amount of Bitcoin sent from A to B, the other says A to C, how do you reconcile these different worldviews? So of course, this is the main idea of traditional consensus. As I mentioned, uh, it's a hot topic. Uh, uh, Arm uh, mentioned that a little bit uh, in his key talk, no talk in the blockchain workshop. User and others organize things again for that great workshop. Uh, but also uh, an active research area, people still are coming up with new different things. Of course, uh, depending on your assumption, like whether it's a synchronous environment where messages will eventually arrive or uh, synchronous where messages will arrive within a bounded delay, there were many different algorithms determined or developed for permission world. So like, well, Paxos can uh, allow the nodes that may crash, but no Byzantine failures, and can tolerate up to half crashes. And of course, B B BFD, uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance, allow uh, if, uh, Byzantine faults up to one third of the uh, uh, group of nodes. So this was active area, but of course, in all of these, uh, you would have the assumption that uh, the nodes are some kind of identified. So with uh, with uh, Bitcoin, uh, with Nakamoto consensus, uh, they are, uh, uh, there is this, each node can come and go at arbitrary time and you have this synchronous network. So uh, it, it is some with the assumption that it can tolerate how to, uh, up to half of the malicious miners. Uh, and the important difference is then in the Nakamoto consensus that's based on proof of work, the blocks are not finalized and pro probability they can be replaced in the future. So unlike traditional consensus, data comments are not final, uh, therefore uh, they can be replaced in the future. And as, as you have heard uh, many times uh, before, if you are familiar with the blockchain, 
you cannot just uh, assume a transaction is valid uh, once it's put on the block. There is a possibility that there may be a fork and that that block can, can become invalid down the road. So therefore, uh, if the block is further buried in the chain, then there is more likely to, uh, to survive. So it's, it has less probable to change. So the, in the Nakamoto consensus or the proof of work that's used uh, on Bitcoin, you would have 10 minutes between uh, blocks in average and the medium time until a, a, a network node receives a, a Bitcoin bl block is around 6.5 seconds. So clearly uh, it, it changes over time. Clearly it is very uh, inefficient compared to the other transactions networks such as Visa where there's centralized trust and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so, uh, let's go into a little bit deeper on Bitcoin and especially what the Bitcoin data looks like. Uh, so in Bitcoin, uh, you have two inherent problems. It's authenticity. So do you really have the funds? Do you really have the amount of Bitcoin that you are sending? And of course, you don't want to, you want to prevent double spending. So you can just send the same uh, amount to the two different people. So here, uh, for example, you may have a Bitcoin transaction from Jim to Chris, and there you want to send two Bitcoins, basically. So, uh, and in each transaction, and that's the important part uh, in Bitcoin network, you are also listing that, well, I want to use the two Bitcoins I received in block two transaction one. And this information is used to identify and verify the transactions. And then you are also saying that uh, you sign all of this using a digital signature. So digital signatures are an important building block of all these transactions. Later on, uh, later on, uh, you can have different transactions. For example, uh, Junaid uh, can send uh, uh, some one Bitcoin to draw two Bitcoin to uh, Tim using three Bitcoins uh, he received at a certain time and this could be signed by Junaid. So the important thing is that a transaction may have multiple input addresses and multiple output addresses. In other words, each person here is an address and each transaction has multiple of them. And as I mentioned, the issue is solved with encrypted signatures and showing proof of funds. So you, and, and the Bitcoin uh, nodes verify that, that that funds exist, the digital signatures check, and that fund is not reused in, the, in other block in the future. Uh, uh, of course, uh, confirmation of payments or preventing double spending would have required more uh, uh, work. Uh, so in the core uh, blockchain, uh, this proof of work idea is, is used based on the earlier work in cryptography. Uh, in the earlier work in crypto, uh, this idea of proof of work is developed to prevent uh, things like spam. Uh, and an email, for example, may be required to, to attach some computation about the email. So therefore sending it each email has a cost. So you can say if a proof of work is not attached, then you assume that its email is spam, else uh, you may have proof of work which simply count the words. And if the word count is correct, uh, then you say uh, the email may be legitimate run a regular spam detector. If it's wrong, then you assume it's spam as well. Of course, word count is not too costly for a spammer to fake, but if you replace it with a more costly cryptography cache function or other variants, this may cost more in terms of computation to spammer. So, so therefore, proof of work uh, can be parameterized in general with a difficulty level, and it makes you uh, it, it it becomes costly to uh, generate this proof of work thing. So, uh, and uh, it can be used for spam, but also it, as we will see, this idea could be used for the consensus problem. Yeah, I, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Okay. 
so like in this context, um, is it that the count of the world is used as the hash pre-image? Yeah, so I mean, this is just a simple example. You can do uh, proof of work. In the original paper, they were even thinking about like uh, solving a small factorization. For example, you can email server before you send an email, you can send them a small integer where ask the email server to factorize it for you. So the idea is that each email sending should have a cost. Uh, so the original one, I don't, I don't know, uh, this is an example with count of words, but you can replace it with any computational expensive thing. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the issue is that you want to make this uh, difficulty uh, based on maybe some difficulty level. And uh, as you will see that although in, in count itself, it can, it can be, uh, it can be uh, slightly different, but you can add things like uh, you can ask the email server to compute, given the word count, how much you need to uh, reach 50, for example. So this would require you maybe 15 more words added to, the, to it, or you can do other computation. So even in the simple example, you can see that you can change the uh, computational cost. So, but of course, in, uh, in Bitcoin, you would have uh, proof of work uh, where you would spend time and effort to create a block. So therefore, each block will have a cost and this cost will allow you to select the leader to create the next block. So this way you slow down the attackers and also by adding new nodes to the network will not, your will not change your chance to create the next block. Because what it really matters when we do this proof of work is that uh, you need to have the computation power. So Bitcoin will use a, a hash puzzle for proof of work. And the main idea is that you would find by changing a nonce value, you would find a hash that satisfy a given difficulty. And I'll explain what that given difficulty means is, is. but basically you have to change the inputs in your hash uh, so you, in this case, it, it is not that hash functions, cryptographic hash functions, or those who have taken crypto, uh, are assumed to be uh, pseudo-random. In other words, if, even if you change one bit, it would change almost everything in the uh, hash value. So the issue is that you want to, to change your message and find a value that satisfies a certain difficulty. And I'll explain what that difficulty is in the next slide. So basically, uh you would add so you have the hash of the blocks remember again we have blocks and each block contains transactions and the tra and the blocks will be chained together and we want to get this hash of block okay and then the issue becomes given all of these hashes uh, of the content in the block we want to find the nonce which is we add the, that blocks, this nonce value, such that the entire hash satisfies some difficulty. Simple difficulty means that the entire hash, if we represent as a 256-bit integer, must be smaller than some value. Okay, that's how you adjust difficulty. Okay, so if this is satisfied, so simply you do a like less than type of check. If this is satisfied, then the block will be mined successful and you can post the block. Okay, uh, and the miner either increase, assuming this is a cryptographic cache function, just keep increasing the nonce is the same as just randomly uh, changing the nonce because it wouldn't give you any advantage because if it's a random number, equal, the, the problem that a certain nonce will work is roughly the same. So, uh, of course, uh, it may, you cannot find that nonce maybe in some, uh, limits the amount of time so then you can maybe start your over by rearranging blocks you can change because the rearranging blocks will change the hash value of the original part so there are some tricks that you can play to find that nonce that works for a given block once this happens then the proof of work will be satisfied 
So this entire mining process is, is the gathering of these transactions that are in the system waiting, creating a block out of them and advertising it to the other nodes. Uh, and the creating this block is the computational process performed on the transactions using this proof of work. So the valid block should have a valid proof of work nonce there for the given system difficulty, okay? And, and then uh, the important thing is that each block is limited on blockchain. So there, and remember each block will have around 10 minutes approximately to, to validate. So therefore every 10 minutes we'll have a block, each block will have one megabyte and it will have around 3K transactions. Uh, also, of course, because of the block rewards, which I won't mention too much, but whenever you create the block, the, as a uh, miner, you, you would get a block reward. Uh, you, can, you can even, some miners will try to have a uh, block with one transaction only. So therefore there is this incentive problem there and there's lots of analysis on how do you incentivize miners correct to be truthful. But uh, we will not go into details in this, uh, in this thing because the miners may try to cheat and may try to reduce, refuse certain transactions for various reasons. Uh, so anyone can create transactions. You don't have to be a miner to create a transaction but only miners can create blocks. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, it was very profitable at one point. Uh, people tried to use their organizational resources like supercomputers to uh, mine these blocks uh, and uh, get the Bitcoin reward associated with it. Uh, so as, as we mentioned during the mining, uh, several issues are addressed. Since nothing is physical, there is no real money, etc. The coins you spend may be fake, so you verify the source. Even when the coins are not fake, you may have already spent it, so you have to quickly, all of these nodes have uh, indexes, which we'll talk a little bit later on, to quickly verify that uh, it's not reused in the history, so you verify the history. And the third thing is that the issuer of the transaction should be the owner of those address. That's where you verify the users. And finally, input uh, and output uh, must match. So therefore, the amounts should be correct. So you verify the amount. A miners checks and verify all these steps uh, before a transaction is added to the block. Uh, there are many nodes on the blockchain. We run a blockchain nodes from time to time uh, to gather all the blockchain information and see the transactions, some of the transactions. Uh, but we are not trying to mine because mining is a, a numbers game and you have to have a huge capacity to be able to mine uh, these uh, uh, blocks. As I mentioned, uh, there is an incentive for mining. Uh, block rewards halves every four years. So it was, uh, it started with 50 Bitcoins per block. And uh, based on this halving every four years, eventually we will have uh, 21 million Bitcoins in total. Uh, this uh, may, we would, uh, soon we will have another half, halving of the uh, blockchain rewards. So in other words, whenever a miner successfully mine a block, it will get the uh, block reward, which is set based on the current rate. And then there is the transaction fee. And uh, in this example, imagine uh, I'm, I'm saying that I'm using this three Bitcoin block, the Bitcoins I received in block one transaction three, but I'm sending 0 0.8 bitcoins to Joe and two bitcoins to Tim. The difference, which is 0 0.2, because the, if you think about it, I'm inputting three bitcoins and I'm only sending 0 0.8 bitcoin to Joe, two bitcoin to Tim. This difference of 0 0.2 bitcoins is a transaction fee. So therefore, when a block, uh, when a miner mines a block, we would get the sum of all transaction fees. And it's up to the, uh, uh, the, the uh, issue of a transaction to set the transaction fee. 
So you may set it zero, but then no miner may uh, take it. Or you may set it to a, a higher number or a higher Bitcoin value, then the miners will have more incentives to prioritize your transaction than the others in the network. So you would see this transaction fee fluctuates over time based on the contention in the network. So as I mentioned, uh, May 2020, the block reward will halve to 6.25 Bitcoins. In, uh, two, uh, in a long time period, it will be practically zero. After that point, you have to have mainly transaction fees for incentives for miners. Uh, and then uh, around November 2018, the block reward was 12.5 Bitcoins. Bitcoin price fluctuates, so each Bitcoin is around two, 3,000 now. At one point, it was 20,000. So how much you are getting with respect to US dollar changes. And tra <laughs> transaction fees was about 0 0.05 Bitcoin uh, per transaction. Uh, uh, fees are uh, are trivial or low if the market volume in the transaction volume is low. Uh, but when there are contention in the network, if for example in December 2017, uh, the fees per block reached to seven uh, Bitcoin per block. So therefore, based on the demand and supply, these fees also change. As I mentioned, uh, when, when the mining happens, there is this uh, hardness issue. Uh, but uh, the, in order to be more fine-grained, uh, Bitcoin network just don't uh, look at the number of zeros as the as difficulty. Okay, in the earlier works, uh, some other uh, cryptocurrencies tried to use this number of zeros but if, if you think about it, uh, it, number of zeros is a rough proxy for difficulty because difficulty is a, a simply a floating point number in Bitcoin. If you look at the Bitcoin headers, it's a, like a point, uh, floating point number. So how you achieve that floating point number is that you want the uh, hash value to be less than two to the power of that floating point number. So therefore, uh, or, uh, in other words, uh, you, you, you could increase and decrease difficulty. If you just focused on the preceding zero, if you increase one zero, you almost double the difficulty in terms of hash value. Instead, uh, you wanted to uh, get it uh, and changing uh, more fine grain. Uh, therefore, this value, so basically, simply based on difficulty, you compute an integer and the hash of the block after you change the nonce must be smaller than that computed integer based on difficulty. So the number of zeros preceding zeros is a rough thing. Uh, I don't uh, have, uh, Sharat asks, do you know how much money in terms of dollars is transacted using Bitcoins during a day? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I, I had the numbers. So we will have some numbers chat uh, later on. I don't have it on my top of my head, uh, but it's nothing compared to what's happening uh, in the dollar market or SWIFT network. So uh, basically to roughly to give an idea, uh, we had an event that we organized with Julia and Junaid and a few other collaborators there was an ex-Fed, uh, local Fed New York official. So apparently Fed New York and SWIFT uh, had trillion dollar transactions maybe in a day, couple of days. Bitcoin is at most billion. So if you think about the amount of transactions, minuscule compared to dollar transactions happening every day. Even the Fed, Fed is processing much more and SWIFT is also maybe order or two order of magnitudes more than uh, what's happening in uh, the, uh, the Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is small, it's very small compared to what dollar works is around. I'll tell you the exact numbers in the second half. Uh, so sometimes uh, this, uh, this value uh, is adjusted, this uh, Bitcoin difficulty is adjusted as I mentioned over time to make sure that 
uh, roughly one block every 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, and uh, therefore, uh, it would uh, it could decrease over time. It could increase over time. So this is difficulty over time. And difficulty means basically roughly how much more hashing you have to do compared to the original uh, genesis block. So the in, if increasing difficulty means how much more costly to do it now than when you started first. Uh, so of course, uh, so currently approximately you need to have 10 to 21 tries to find a valid nonce due to this difficulty. Uh, of course, the maximal would be 10 to 77 nonce values. So which means you almost require everything to be zero and just one uh, at the end. So that would be the called difficulty one in the, uh, if you look at the Bitcoin things, so it will require you to try 10 to 77 nonce values. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there were lots of criticism about this uh, Bitcoin mining and, uh, and the potential of an issue about climate change efforts and so on, because every miner tries to win this lottery and one miner wins every 10 minutes and the many others are lose uh, and waste electricity. I don't have it on the slides, but it would be very interesting to look, see the pictures of these uh, mining constructions, uh, I mean, Bitcoin mining in China, for example. They have all these A6 special chips uh, built on uh, uh, like uh, special racks and you can see like entire warehouse full of them. So if they lose one uh, mining, then it means that uh, all this energy is wasted. Uh, so some uh, people like uh, who are involved in Bitcoin world says that the cost of having no central authority is the cost of that energy. So when you have central authority such as Visa or MasterCard who are processing transactions, you don't need to waste this energy because they are arbiter of the truth. But when you don't have this trusted authority for the consensus, you have to waste this energy. And uh, of course, some people even argue that Bitcoin mining has been an expensive way to bet that bit, the price of Bitcoin would rise uh, and it's been a hit engine. But of course, people, in order to prevent this, there's lots of work to move beyond proof of work that's too costly to scale and it has all these problems with respect to uh, uh, with respect to he, this wasted heat and energy. Uh, of course, uh, not every blockchain is a permissionless setting. And we'll talk about private blockchains and how uh, they, were, they are using it. Uh, if you're attended uh, uh, the, <coughs> the discussion about Hyperledger uh, by uh, 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 the IBM folks, uh, you will know that there's also effort on the permissions aspect, and we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, the, if the trust in participants uh, can be leveraged, in other words, if you can register restrict number of uh, nodes that will participate in consensus, then you can use all these uh, be, uh, be, uh, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant or or those kind of ideas and uh, make it much more efficient. But uh, the, instead of proof of work, uh, there are some alternatives that's also called under proof of X umbrella. That's alternative to the proof of work and that they claim to have uh, much less computational cost. Uh, and each alternative of these have this flavor of the minor uh, show a proof that they have done enough work or they have spent enough wealth before creating a work block. One example is proof of burn. Miner sacrifices wealth uh, to create a transaction by sending some coins to a verifiable unspendable address. In other words, you sacrifice your money to validate the transaction. Of course, the issue is that uh, it will reduce the total coin supply every time you validate a transaction and it will make the rewarding mechanism complicated. Uh, there is a proof of stake, which is uh, the, this is being tried uh, to be adopted 
by uh, uh, Ethereum. And the main idea is that, that you stake a claim when you uh, uh, mine the uh, block and uh, the claim would be based on the coin and the age. So the longer the coin exists, the more value it will have. But once the block is uh, mined, you use your coin and their age becomes zero. The coin exists, but it won't be, it cannot be used for staking. Of course, like many areas, so this in this setting as well, the uh, rich gets richer. Uh, so the more coins you have, the more you can bid, the more you earn. Uh, so this could happen. There's also discussion about the fact that in Bitcoin, miners have similarly uh, coalesced and there are four five mining uh, organizations or consortiums that uh, control more than 50 percent of the hash rate so some argue that this is inevitable uh, but still uh, there is a delegated proof of stake uh, where they try to uh, identify ordinary nodes to vote as well with, with, with miners uh, but you, miners can try to buy the votes and so on so this this may have issues uh there is uh, there is also uh this uh, memory hard proof of work out there so when you use standard hash like sha256 they are they were by design uh built to have small memory footprint which means that you can build asics for those hashing to to do very fast hash rates uh, the implication is that if you have more money, if you can build more mining rigs and more ASIC uh, chips, you can do this hashing quickly. So it turns out that uh, you can do uh, memory cost hash functions, or in other words, mem costly uh, memory hard hash functions, which require lots of memory. And loss of memory will imply that uh, you, it will be much more costly to build ASICs on it then you have to use regular CPUs, and that may, be, uh, that may make this uh, ASIC-based things uh, useless. Uh, but of course, still, this wastes lots of energy, so it wouldn't save you uh, that much. So there are many others, proof of ownership, proof of publication, proof of storage, uh, proof of XYZ is coming every day. Uh, uh, this is an active area of research for the public blockchains to replace proof of work with something else. And there are even different uh, consensus protocols that are, that are out there, like Algorand has some. But again, this is just a brief introduction of how blockchains work, what the blockchain data may look like. And again, we will be focusing on more mining and analyzing and uh, this data. Uh, so, to summarize, proof of work X is still a work in progress without much deployment success to show for it. Ethereum is trying it for a while. They, they couldn't uh, the, uh, push the proof of stake yet. Uh, so the cost for having no central authority is the cost of wasted energy kind of continues today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, that we have this private and public blockchain versions. Uh, in the permissionless public blockchain, such as Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, and in the permission blockchain space, you have Hyperledger R3. You can get the Ethereum and run a private blockchain version of, of it as well, which we use in our research for combining uh, blockchains uh, to uh, secure machine learning and data sharing uh, ideas. And in the public blockchain, as I mentioned, any uh, user can join uh, and become a part of the node and see all the transactions. Uh, for, of course, uh, corporate settings, uh, the transparency means that Airbus can learn company finances and, and buy and sell relationships. So, so the security and privacy issues is problematic. There are some uh, blockchains and proposals out there to remediate this by using strong encryption and secure multi-party computation techniques or, and or zero knowledge stuff to hide these uh, things, but still it will be too costly. So the permissioned uh, networks have been uh, basically uh, developed uh, 
uh, to create uh, per, uh, industrial settings. And permission means that, remember, we, we don't need proof of X anymore. You can use any Byzantine agreement protocol, uh, like P, PFPT, uh, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerant Protocol. So that will compute, that will require less power consumption, it will be more secure and it will be, you only the data will be seen by the people who are agreed. And most of these private blockchains have further um, access control mechanisms so that you can limit the data to be seen to a certain subset of people. But of course, this is a gated community. So you have to have a trust relationship built before you can do this uh, private blockchains. So of course, uh, we motivated and discussed the blockchain from the point of the usage in Bitcoin because that's the first white, uh, uh, first common usage of Bitcoin. Uh, but Bitcoin, uh, sorry, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies was the first uh, common usage of blockchain. But there is nothing uh, to stop at just storing financial transactions. There are efforts and uh, startups almost in every area of uh, like storing documents. I know a startup, for example, focusing on uh, storing documents related to uh, the public real estate transactions. So this way you don't have to, you can publicly verify real estate transaction. You don't need to count county register office in US to check whether this uh, transaction occurred. Uh, you can put all these digital documents on the chain and then in private blockchains there are the shipping logs, manufacturing logs. Uh, there is a specific blockchains for keeping IoT data. Of course, there are lots of design choices uh, and uh, how to do it. Uh, and we are not talking this work, but most of the time, for security, privacy, and efficiency reasons, uh, you have to really combine uh, some on-chain storage, some off-chain storage, and also we, at least in our research, this is me, the second part, advocating a combination of private and, uh, and public blockchain or a combination of permission and permissionless blockchain uh, to achieve scalability for, for tasks like auctions. And of course, uh, you could, uh, separate this uh, what's stored on the chain what's not stored on the chain and make a decisions based on it uh, so oh, now of course uh, when you say storage this kind of ties back to database where this conference is all about and data science uh, uh, as we mentioned uh, blockchains can only achieve uh, hundreds or maximum thousand transactions per second uh, uh, so you have to insert data because it will be uh, since the number of transactions on things like Bitcoin, uh, especially public blockchains, are limited. It's easy to insert, uh, but querying can be costly. Remember, you have to check whether a transaction is used uh, in the past. When you were you submit a Bitcoin transaction, you are basically saying that okay, this uh, transaction is uh, you have to verify as a miner that the transaction and the coins in that transaction is not reused or it hasn't been used before. So this requires you to query the, the blockchain to see that that's the case. Uh, Bitcoin used to write just these two in some files. Neither blockchains try to have like key value stores like level DB to solve these issues. Of course, there is uh, nothing preventing you to use much more efficient storage things like traditional databases. There are graph databases out there and there are even key value stores. And uh, this, in other words, making the blockchain more accessible or easier to process transactions using more optimized data storage alternatives is uh, co coming up. Uh, and also there is this other aspects of combining uh, uh, blockchains as a storage layer and build uh, database capability on top uh, such as this uh, blockchain DB world, world where uh, you, they created a shared database on blockchains 
and uh, extends blockchain by classical data management techniques and sharding ideas. So you could really marry, I think there's also work and potential work in this area. There are already many great works happening. Uh, and of course, you can add new functionality to the existing DB things, uh, such as uh, you can have uh, in the uh, big chain DB, uh, they try to have a distributed database with some of the nice blockchain characteristics, such as immutability, decentralized control, creation and movement of digital assets. So they are trying to have these blockchain characteristics without having this cost of proof of work. Uh, again, you have nodes, this is kind of in the permissioned setting, but also they added things like smart contract on top of the database. So in a distributed setting, you would have this smart contracts. So we will see, so in a sense, we are seeing that the databases can help to query the data. Furthermore, you can marry the blockchain characteristics to the databases as well. Uh, there are, uh, uh, there are these data storage solutions, for example, like ForkBase, that extracts data from blockchain and stores in its native data structure. And since uh, uh, there is this forks may happening, uh, I didn't mention it very uh, deeply in the beginning, but basically uh, we said that the guarantee is probabilistic because the forks may happen. So it's possible possible on Bitcoin that at a given time, two, two miners may successful in finding a block with correct nonce that satisfies the difficulty. So now what happens is that once this uh, uh, happens, uh, uh, it's going to create a fork in the network. By default in Bitcoin, it's stated that each miner should follow the longest chain. So that's over time, these forks will be, will be solved, uh, but there is a possibility that you may have a fork in the network and the transaction may not be valid because it may be in the losing fork. So, uh, so fork base is an example where they are trying to uh, support data types other than blockchains and the store manages this multi version because of the forking. This is the architecture taken from the paper. So, so this managing these transactions and these networks become an uh, important, uh, important uh, direction. There are also newer query models happening on uh, b my querying blockchain data. Uh, for example, there is a SQL-like language uh, for Ethereum querying. Uh, I'll talk about what Ethereum is in a second, but it's uh, another type of uh, uh, blockchain. And uh, there is some work out there uh, where this Ethereum, there's a question before I go any further, Shard. Uh, are there any specific advantages of using one database or other in storing blockchain data in databases? Also, is there any complexity? So basically, uh, for, uh, there, there is, depending on what you want to achieve, uh, Shard. So one, is, one thing is that, um, if, if, it's the, if your goal is to really doing a verification during the Bitcoin and or Ethereum, having a key value data set, database is good enough and it will be fast enough for you because you want to make sure that there is no double spending happening. So you want to make sure that that key happy, that happens only once, for example. Uh, but when you are doing analytics uh, later on, uh, as we will talk about in the second half, where we try to mine these, and where we try to analyze, build uh, data analytics models to predict, let's say, um, malicious transactions and other things, you may want to opt out for NoSQL databases, etc. So therefore, depending on the application, I guess it's coming from the, there's no one size fits all type of thing. Depending on the application, different databases will have different advantages of the store the data. Okay, uh, so I say I answered the question and move on. Again, please please ask questions via the Q and A. Uh, and if uh, if I haven't answered your questions, uh, I'll unmute you and you can ask directly. Uh, so 
uh, as I mentioned, you, you can, there are some efforts to develop query languages. I know in uh, Hyperledger, for example, they are trying to do a different querying language to store their, uh, the data they have. Uh, so there is uh, also lots of effort in uh, performance analysis. Uh, one work uh, done uh, by uh, Blockbench, they try to look into how different uh, uh, private blockchains. Here, as I mentioned, Ethereum can be used as a private blockchain as well. So, and uh, you can set up uh, the Ethereum in a private model. This will show you how many transactions, different uh, blockchains, uh, different private blockchains against different data processing workloads. You would see that uh, throughput is uh, much higher in Hyperledger fabric. And, uh, and then uh, depending on the uh, uh, workloads which uh, that's developed by uh, the uh, the benchmark block bench group so they have a different workload like one's a small bank workload the other is the uh, and they call it YCSP uh, and based on this work workload uh, you would see that uh, number of transactions uh, with eight clients and eight servers uh, the Hyperledger seems to have a higher throughput. Uh, the latency uh, is uh, also is lower in, in the network called parity uh, compared to others. And you can see how the throughput changes for different uh, ones uh, based on the number of nodes and also the latency based on number of loads. So there is also already effort to uh, look into performance of these different alternatives under different workloads and queries more on the private blockchain because uh, like bitcoin is bitcoin uh, of course there are lots of efforts on it like uh, like segregated witness etc to improve it uh, the transaction counts but still uh, it has limited number of transactions available per minute uh, there is some uh, uh, newer work on uh, uh, on creating and storing this data for blockchain analytics. As I mentioned uh, to Sharad's question, that uh, uh, this uh, this blockchain uh, analytics may may use different uh, databases. One example is, is BlockSci. They use a level DB Equivalent database to uh, parse the Bitcoin data and then query this Bitcoin, Bitcoin data using uh, these databases. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there is this data eater for Ethereum. They are using some elastic search, basically to mine the blocks, uh, extract data from blocks, and they store it on Elasticsearch and then use Elasticsearch query. Elasticsearch, if you have used it, it's a specific uh, query language uh, where you can do this document-based searching. So different uh, analytics framework where the data is extracted for analysis uh, is using different type of storage mechanisms for different uh, goal, processing goals. There's also of, uh, blockchain analytics uh, uh, startups and tools out there. Uh, this is a list where you don't, um, we are not showing you all of it. Uh, I'm mentioning Sentiment and Inca. These are two companies that are trying to analyze this blockchain data for various purposes that uh, we, we, we jointly work in the past. There are new ones that are coming. Uh, for thing, there are many of them out there for, for analyzing relationships for KYC, you know, your customer type of settings, like chain analysis have done, uh, have those tools for that. Uh, there is analysis of metadata, there are some tools for it. Uh, analysis of money flows uh, using address clustering and so on. There are Bitcoin conduit, Bitcoin conview. There are websites like Bitcoin talk to, you can do it. Uh, Analysis of user behavior, you can use tools like Blockchain Inspector. Uh, chain analysis have a tool for risk assessment. So there are many, many different uh, tools out there that try to analyze this data and try to uh, give some useful information uh, about uh, the 
about uh, block blockchain uh, transactions, especially Bitcoin transactions. So most of them are, as you see, for Bitcoin. Why Bitcoin is the biggest one and the most valuable one? Then the Ethereum also is quite getting developed. There is less tools, but it's getting out there like Monero and others. So the main focus, I would say, till this point is on these these uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. So uh, in order to understand the blockchain and analyzing this blockchain graph, uh, we have to start with distinguishing two main different types of uh, blockchain representations. Uh, the, in the transaction output based blockchains, which is the Bitcoin, you have addresses and each transaction is used as addresses and the, the amount of uh, thing that they have. I have a question on chat. Uh, are these tools utilizing the same or common underlying architecture? Uh, uh, they don't. Uh, the one, they don't use uh, any common underlying architecture. Uh, each of them build on their own favorite ones. Uh, so, for example, I know Inca is using something called Splunk Sentiment. I don't recall now, but they use a different database, different architecture. So it, it looks like uh, everybody is throwing their own favorite database for various reasons or very uh, the analysis tools. So there is no really uh, standard or common architecture. And I think it's not, uh, I think uh, it would be uh, interesting to see which is more efficient for different, different tasks for blockchain analytics. So to summarize, no, there's no common architecture and everybody builds based on what they think is best. There is one more question. Yeah, please do ask your questions via question button and so on. Uh, yeah, during the, uh, the chat, uh, so chat feature may not be available for everybody, so please use the Q&A feature if it's not. Uh, okay, uh, so the other other thing is account-based ones. In account-based ones, you can think of uh, address, uh, addresses or accounts. So each person will, you can have multiple accounts, but you what you will be saying is that I have this account, and from this account, I will be spending five eaters. From this account, I will be spending 10 eaters. In the Bitcoin, you were saying that I would spend all the money I got in this transaction. Okay, and you have to spend all of it. That's the rule for the uh, uh, the Bitcoin. So, uh, as we mentioned, although the main focus on Bitcoin was uh, financial transactions, and you have an 80 byte log field for each transaction if you want to enter. Uh, uh, and the uh, Genesis block. Remember, Genesis block is the first block created by Satoshi himself. Or herself, uh, it's it, it has this message: that times blah blah chances are on the brink of second bailout for banks. So this was the message written on the Genesis blog. Uh, Bitcoin has also something called multi signatures that appear later that will give a control over an account to a distributed trust, which I will not go into the uh, details. Uh, so therefore, you could put any message to the to these 80 bytes. It turns out that there were some malicious usage of it. People put uh, links like of child porn like links to these 80 bytes, uh, so that it will have been these child porn links uh, become permanently stored on the blockchain, basically. So there was. So once you store the data there, especially on a public blockchain, it will stay there uh, kind of forever. Uh, there are other usage of this kind of storage, like uh, name coins. Uh, this is for decentralized namespaces. Uh, so you can think of it as certain key value pairs. So you have a certain name coin uh, key value, and then it will map to a certain address. Uh, uh, so you could have, in a sense, uh, on uh, uh, like a distributed DNS kind of setting using this uh, Bitcoin idea. But of course, the issue with the name coin is that uh, uh, people require a certain extension 
to allow this Bitcoin domain to um, uh, the, this name coin to work. And therefore, the, because of the hardness of use, I guess, and it's not very common uh, to the browsers, uh, the name coin namespaces are uh, underutilized. So in a sense, uh, the, the good idea of storing key value pairs, in, like the key here would be the, the let's say, murat.bit domain, and you would be storing murat.bit with some IP address and so on. So this way uh, you could have this decentralized sensors, re sensor resistant uh, domain namespace mapping functionality. So here the, I'm trying to argue that there is nothing, as we mentioned also before, there is nothing so special about just requiring storing transactions. You can store any data in this immutable ledgers and any code in this immutable ledgers, as we'll see. So as I just said, why stop at cryptocurrencies? Why don't we store more data, different types of data? Uh, of course, the first is the financial transactions and we, we store the financial transaction data, such as uh, sending uh, this from so from, uh, let's say, Jane is sending this to Joe and Tim. So we have this all financial transaction data, but it, it may have messages. Later on, beyond the uh, cryptocurrency, uh, you, would, you would have some roadblocks to non-financial data on Bitcoin itself. First of all, Bitcoin scripting language, it is a scripting language, by the way, and you may use to conditionally open the Bitcoin transactions. So it has some interesting usages in crypto protocol design actually. So you can use the scripting language to put some condition on the transactions, uh, but it's not Turing complete. So you cannot just put all this uh, computational code on the Bitcoin network. And Bitcoin network doesn't want to change it because it would make it, uh, it will have some issues with respect to storage and mining. And then this kind of required, in other words, once you start, try to store programs, arbitrary Turing complete programs, then uh, a new blockchain concept looked like more appropriate. And uh, this was done by the, uh, the uh, Vitalik Buterin on uh, Ethereum. So it, has, it is a blockchain to store data uh, uh, is uh, uh, store data and software code on blockchain. Uh, and similar to Bitcoin, and it is a currency called Ether, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and it has a smart contracts, which is a code basically written in a coding language called Solidity. Uh, simply uh, Solidity is compiled into the Ethereum bytecode, executed on Ethereum virtual machine. And the Ethereum virtual machine uh, is uh, executing these codes basically. Uh, so an analogy to, I guess, uh, the database could be is that you can have stored procedures, right? So you, could, you can think of these smart contracts as stored procedures uh, on, on the Ethereum database. But of course, there will be a, a, a big uh, difference uh, with respect to uh, what's stored and what you can do with uh, these uh, smart contracts. So, uh, so basically a user would create a transaction to upload a smart contract code to an address. The code at the address is replicated in all blockchain nodes. So basically on Ethereum, the code cannot have anything sensed in it because each site will have a copy of the code and you can analyze the code to extract secrets like uh, private keys, for example. So the code you have can only have public key. Uh, so here, each, each participant on the network would store the code. So therefore, this code storage will be costly and will have limits. And the code is executed by passing a message to the, to the function. And execution occurs at all nodes. So if a node wants to verify whether the transaction is correct, 
the node will execute the code, look at the updated state of the virtual machine and the block, and use that updated state to compute the hashes. Therefore, execution should occur all the nodes. So if you think about from a computational point of view, it's a, it's a big waste because everybody executes the same code on every, every message. So therefore, the contract creation, contract execution is expensive. And all calls to the contract will, uh, are built in terms of the operations they require. This is put there to prevent potential infinite loops and so on. So in other words, each operation will have a cost. And then a contract runs out of what's called gas, the contract execution will, will stop. So in the blockchain, for example, uh, the, this is different uh, gas costs from the yellow paper. So you can see the opcodes uh, for the Ethereum virtual machine. And for each opcode, you have certain costs. So as you see, some of the operations, module addition is more costlier than regular addition. So actually, there is, also, there is some effort and some of those papers published in ICD, I think last year or two years ago, to optimize your code so that it will be less costly to run on, your, uh, on Ethereum. So therefore, there is this uh, potential of uh, using Ethereum to, uh, to run the course, uh, to, uh, in other words, optimize your smart contract to, op to get less costly. So each ga gas uh, is, uh, 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 when your gas runs out of, then your contract gas runs out of, then the contract will stop executing and you would get uh, out of gas exception. And gas is simply, uh, I forgot the exact value, 10 to minus something ether. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the exact conversion rate. So it's a much smaller uh, variant of the gas uh, and uh, the gas uh, will be paid upfront by the contract. So, uh, now with Ethereum, you have this public code that can be analyzed by every, every, anyone. Uh, once the code is, is pushed there, as I will say, there will be example, uh, weak exception. Code cannot be modified uh, without leaving a trace. Furthermore, code cannot be changed. As long as the uh, Ethereum network exists, the code execution cannot be stopped. Basically, anyone can execute the code by sending a message to that code. And the results will be verified by all the participants. Uh, therefore, it is verifiable. So the analogy to come to the contracts is that, uh, at least the argument is that if you have a legal contract, it could be enforceable by uh, the law and so on. Here, it, it, once you have the code there, the code will execute whatever happens, as long as the network executes and you cannot just change the code. There are exceptions to a modifiability aspect, which I will talk. Um, so of course, contracts gave rise to smart contract-based tokens, uh, which is basically, you, you can build your own digital token on top to sell things from crypto <laughs> kitties, which I will show a picture of it, to your favorite uh, token. Uh, I've seen uh, different utility tokens, such as uh, you buy a token to uh, store some document on a, some storage infrastructure, or you can buy a token. Uh, I, I've seen a token to sell you some juicing, juice <laughs> down the road. Uh, so there may be uh, many, many different ways of token. One important is the storage token, the storage J token that stores files on your hard disk and pays you a fee through Ethereum. Uh, tokens can be bought or sold using these uh, contracts. They act as a value stores. And token prices are, uh, uh, depending on the popularity of token, you can sell tokens on, uh, on some kind of exchanges. Uh, companies can create tokens and they can sell them in initial coin offerings. Usually, for example, you may, cre you may create, the, this is now the popularity dropped down significantly. But in the past, uh, you could create a company and you, you, you can say that, well, when the company is up and running, 
uh, we will do the service X. Here is a token for service X, so you can pre-buy pre it in the initial coin offering with the hope that it would uh, increase in price. Uh, and of course, uh, there's also uh, analysis of how these transactions work, how this uh, do, you will see there are power laws, happens, user centrality and other graph properties. So there's some work already looking into Ethereum tokens and how people use that. And we will mention uh, the more details about how, how this analysis runs and how, how we can do this analysis in the second part of this uh, tutorial. So this is uh, based on 2018, based on our analysis, uh, you would see how many uh, new ES20 tokens out there, token contracts out there. So you would see the number of uh, tokens, crypto tokens, popularity over time. Uh, we haven't rerun this analysis. So it fluctuates over time, but you would see that there are many, many tokens that has more than 5,000 daily transactions per token. So we, 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 there are even more tokens out there that may not have many transactions. In the past, I was offered to, to do consulting for a company based on a token that they just created on Ethereum. So there are many, many such tokens that are not heavily exchanged hands, but these are the tokens that have at least uh, 5K uh, transactions. Uh, this is the transaction count based on Ethereum tokens. Again, based on, we, we, done, we done it in 2018. We didn't update it yet. We will hopefully soon. Uh, this is the transactions in tokens, like buying, selling tokens on Ethereum. As you see, uh, as the Ethereum prices and the cryptocurrency uh, trends happen, you would see more and more transactions happening using these buying and selling tokens. Initially, the tokens and the implementation of tokens didn't have any standards. And lack of standards create a, a, a problem with respect to uh, buying and selling and automating the sell, sales. So there is a standard called ERS20 now, which, which lists uh, functions to implement. You can transfer uh, money, you can approve a transaction, etc. So these are functions or events described by the ERC standard. So now you can just create a token and there are actually templates out there. You can just download it and adapt it to your need. You can easily create a token on, uh, on uh, Ethereum. So in, addition, so in a sense, in addition to standard buying and selling of Ethereum and transaction on Ethereum or Ethers on Ethereum, now you can buy and sell and exchange tokens on top of it. So now you have additional asset class of crypto tokens in addition to things like Ether. Uh, the ERC20 is for digital things where you don't have uh, unique IDs. So for example, if you buy a store J token, one token is the same as the other token. So you don't need to uniquely identify them. But there is this, another token standard called ERC721 uh, to create non-fungible tokens. Uh, one is called CryptoKitties. At one point in time, uh, CryptoKitty transaction was the uh, most transaction on Ethereum uh, for a couple of weeks, maybe like one or two years back. So you may ask what is CryptoKitties? Kitties, uh, you pay money to this contract and it will give you a unique DNA, which is like 200 whatever, a certain number of bits, DNA for your kitties. And when you input it to the contract, it gives you a picture. And interestingly, you can make them to get different kitties. And different type of kitties have different uh, uh, prevalence. In other words, like the probability of getting certain type uh, changes. So, so there are some rare kitty types and there are more common types. And the prices change based on that. Uh, there was, I think, at one point, there were like crypto kitties sold for $20,000 or so. So it's like, uh, uh, I would say, wild, wild best on things. Uh, so if you implement an ERC721 compliant token, you would get this, this unique ID to your asset. So this could be used for 
for example, uniquely identifying uh, maybe a real estate transaction, etc. Uh, this is a second popular standard after ERC20, uh, but it's much less deployed because the storage requirements are harder because you have to uh, keep track of each instance and do something about it. Uh, so there, are, there is this ERC721. Uh, as I mentioned that uh, when you have this uh, smart contract code on Ethereum, uh, it would uh, allow you to uh, have this decentralized organizations or allow you to run the smart contracts. And here, uh, using the smart contracts, theoretically, you can have this decentralized organizations where the name refers to this decentralized autonomous organization that lives on blockchain and people vote, may vote and do other kind of community activity on it. And they may be used theoretically again to run companies and organizations. And uh, the organizations may add these smart contracts and uh, based on these smart contracts and what of the participants, maybe you can make investment decisions. Uh, but the first uh, DAO was hacked uh, and, uh, and actually this created a big issue. There was a bug in the smart code. Remember the one problem with uh, immutability is that if there is a bug, it's hard to change it. Impossible to change it actually in some cases. So the only way the DAO hack uh, that caused by this bug in the smart contract was to fork the Ethereum. So it created a, a, a fork in Ethereum history. So they, they undo the transaction associated with DAO uh, to remediate the end result of the hack. So of course, uh, some people objected to the fact that what is the blockchain philosophy is immutability. So why would we go back and change it? So it's called the split in Ethereum world, basically. So there's lots of active research on how to verify this contract code how to find vulnerabilities in this contract code. Uh, the next uh, I would like to briefly mention is the stable coins and the centralized finance. Uh, stable coin is a smart contract based asset whose price is kind of tied to a physical world asset. Uh, there is one that's called Tether that has one UST. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you would uh, prevent users uh, from the fluctuation of uh, the crypto assets such as Bitcoin in terms of dollar prices. Uh, uh, and the argument is that stable coins may be a safe harbor to store your wealth. Uh, one example given to me is that in some developing countries, the governments may uh, seize assets or hard currency uh, uh, now the question becomes how would you prevent it if you have a coin you can transfer your wealth and the governments cannot capture it uh, uh, and uh, of course this is a very uh, different discussion uh, when we talk with our finance colleagues there is all these issues about tax privacy and know your customer rules which could be very, uh, very important for banks or financial institutions due to money laundering regulations. So there is this interesting thing happening. And some of the people are claiming that the uh, Bitcoin transactions are mainly used for uh, money laundering purposes. So there is this, uh, I would say money laundering and other aspects. Uh, so uh, if you look at the price of uh, different coins and uh, 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 stable coin designs all the time. Stable coins use race meca mechanisms to stabilize the uh, price of the coin. So basically they need to dynamically adjust uh, their uh, demand and supply so that uh, each coin is uh, tied to its pack within certain limits. Uh, I won't go into more details if you're interested about how stable coins we designed, uh, I would recommend this uh, nice paper. Uh, so uh, investors clearly can buy these coins and make changes in how it's going. 
and uh, you can uh, benefit from these decisions. Uh, uh, so there is usually in tokens, you may have a second type of token called governance token. So you can think of it like a special class in uh, thing to vote for decisions. Uh, uh, so basically, uh, sometimes you would hear the term coin versus token. Most of the popular ones are Ethereum tokens at this point. Uh, uh, so some people argue that uh, stable coins would be uh, allow the Bitcoins to have next generations of uh, decentralized finance. And there are many efforts on that front like Libra and others. Uh, but again, this wouldn't be the focus today. Uh, so, uh, I would like to answer any questions you may have. In the second part, we would go into details and generate a little bit discussion on how to uh, analyze and model this data and what can we do with this data. And the importance is that uh, if you think about it in Bitcoin, you, you have access all the transactions ever happened because they are present on the blockchain and you can download that blockchain. Of course, there are some transactions that are settled uh, in private hands out of the, like on Coinbase type of exchanges, but any significant transactions uh, are noted in the uh, Bit Bitcoin blockchain. Therefore, you can analyze it for various purposes that, as we will show. So I would like to answer any questions, if there are any. Uh, you can use Q&A or chat window. Uh, if not, uh, I think we will give a half an hour break. Am I right in the yeah, program? Yes, yeah, so we will have a half an hour. So uh, actually I have a, like a sure, question. Um, uh, so you, you mentioned the different the proof of uh, X kind of mm -hmm. uh, mining algorithms, like a, if for proof of stake, um, do you think it's still, um, consistent with this uh, uh, decentralized design. Like uh, if you have higher stake, you have more coins, then you will be more trusted. Uh, so, so there is lots of online discussion happening on it. Uh, I read the Ethereum forums and the proof of stake discussion there. I highly recommend it if you're interested. So their argument is that, well, uh, this concentration of power is happening. Anyway, look at Bitcoin. There are only four or five uh, mining uh, consortiums that uh, controls it anyway. And uh, if you want to change anything in Bitcoin protocol, you have to fly to China and convince some of those who are, who are based there. So therefore, this proof of the power concentration happens, whatever you do. So that's not a big issue. So to me, I'm not so sure. I think uh, they have to start small and that's the goal, I guess, and see whether it really works before really scaling into larger groups. So I think the, to summarize, the jury is still out there with respect to uh, whether the proof of stake will work or which proof of X will work. But I think we will be staying with proof of work for some more um, some more time in the future. So I don't think it's going to phase out quickly. So proof of work is here to stay, looks like at least in the foreseeable future. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Uh, so uh, I'll stop, sh uh, I'll keep the slides as it is. Uh, and we will continue in half an hour with the second I, part. Yeah, and will will be, uh, I'm not sure if it is a different uh, Zoom link uh, or is the same one, but it posted as a two two different links. So I think it must be the same Zoom link. Zoom link. Okay, so we will stay in this room. Yeah, we will stay in this room. Please do stay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See you soon. So we will have 30 minutes break. Yeah, so have a break. Have your coffee and things, and come back, please. <laughs>